Well, today we are continuing our series, Candle Light at Christmas, and we want to speak on the subject, the light of joy. And uh, you've been sitting a lot, so I'm going to ask you to stand again with me this morning as we look to the Word of the Lord. Our text for this morning's message is found in Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. Back in 1977, George Lucas, the director, came out with Star Wars. It was a show that began with the words, long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. You remember that? Well, this morning we're talking about the light of joy, and it's also a story that could begin long, long ago. But rather than in a galaxy far away, it would be in a land far away. The story actually doesn't begin 2,000 years ago that I want to talk about this morning. The story begins 2,700 years ago. And it doesn't begin in joy. It begins in sorrow. You see, there were dark days in Israel. The people were in rebellion against God. They had established idols. And they were worshiping and going after the foreign gods that belonged to the nations around them. And so in the midst of that darkness, God raised up prophets. And he gave the prophets the message to preach to the people, a message of repentance. That if they would repent, then God would forgive them and would heal their land. But if they would not repent, then judgment would fall. Because while God was a gracious God, he was also a God of justice. Well, unfortunately, the people did not accept the message of the prophets. Rather... They persecuted and killed the prophets. Isaiah was sawn in two. Jeremiah, stoned to death. Ezekiel, murdered while in exile. Amos, beaten to death. I mean, if you were going to be a prophet in the Old Testament, you'd better be called of God because that was not a vocation that a lot of people were lining up for. In the midst of that darkness, in the midst of the doom in the midst of the sin, God raised up these prophets and they were put to death. And then God raised up another prophet, one by the name of Micah. He was from a small town called Morasheth Gath. It was a small village about 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem. It was away from the centers of political and religious power. And so it comes as no surprise that his ministry was to the lowly. His ministry was to the outcast. He ministered to those who were lame, to those who were of humble origins. He challenged the leaders of Samaria and Jerusalem, and he gave them two significant prophecies. The first, he prophesied the destruction of Samaria. And at that time, Samaria was the capital of Israel. This was a divided kingdom with the 12 tribes being divided with 10 in the northern kingdom known as Israel and two in the southern kingdom known as Judah. And Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom, Judah. He prophesied the fall of Samaria and then he prophesied the fall of Jerusalem. Well, sadly... His prophecies were fulfilled. In 722 B.C., Assyria invaded. They conquered Israel and carried its people off into captivity. And then in 597 B.C., Babylon invaded and conquered Judah and carried its people off to captivity as well. These were dark days in Israel. But how many of you know that when it is the darkest, the light shines the brightest? Amen? And that's exactly what happened for the people of Israel. God was just, but God was also gracious. And so he raised up Micah who prophesied a judgment that would be followed by restoration. And this prophecy was given 700 years before the birth 
of Jesus. Listen to the words. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. As a beacon of hope in the darkness that was shrouding Israel in confusion and sin, this prophecy was given seven centuries before Jesus was born. In exile, the Israeli slaves held to this message of hope as they would tell each other, a ruler in Israel will arise. God will bring us deliverance. In Bethlehem, a king will be born. From the city of David, a son will be given. It was a message of hope, a message of expectation. It gave courage to the weary exiles as they waited the promised Messiah. And that kind of sets the backdrop for the text that we're looking at today. It was a humble setting. It happened in the fields surrounding Bethlehem, another small, insignificant village. Population at that time was a few hundred. It occurred during this very common scene of shepherds who were out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. It was a lowly position, being a shepherd. It was looked down upon by many in society. In fact, many people, if they saw a shepherd coming, would just turn and go the other way. They were too good for shepherds. In fact, the Egyptians would not speak to shepherds unless they absolutely had to. Shepherds were not allowed to testify in a court of law. They were very lowly. They were on the lowest rung of the scale, if you will. A very humble position. And yet, shepherds were chosen to be the first who would testify of Messiah. Let that sit in your heart for a while. Because it reminds us that God chooses the lowly to confound the mighty. God chooses the foolish to shame the wise. If you think you're hot stuff, God's probably not going to use you. But if you recognize your utter dependency upon Him and come to Him with humility, the Lord just might have some work for you to do. And so God chose the shepherds to be the first to testify that Messiah was coming. But why did He choose Bethlehem? Well, if you recall from our study of Ruth earlier this year, Bethlehem means house of what? Bread. House of bread. Jesus said, I am the bread that has come down from heaven. What makes more sense than that he would be born in house of bread, Bethlehem. Also, Bethlehem is the home of the tower of the flock, Migdal Idar. That was the birthplace for the lambs that would be sacrificed in the temple. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. What better place for him to be born than in the tower of the flock? And also we know that Bethlehem is the city of David. An insignificant village except for it was the birthplace of David, the great king of Israel, the son of Jesse. And we're told that Jesus would be of the line of David, that he would be the root of Jesse, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Bethlehem, what better place for the Messiah to be born? So go with me in your mind's eye tonight, or this morning, back to that starlit field outside of Bethlehem. The sheep have been bedded down for the night. You can hear the quiet crackle of the fire and the chirping of the crickets. A canopy of stars has been stretched out over the evening sky. The tired shepherds are now taking turns, keeping watch over the flock. It's a peaceful, quiet, serene setting. And then suddenly, an angel of the Lord appears and the glory of the Lord shines around them and they are greatly afraid. Do not be afraid, the angel said, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, 
lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host is praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. It was a celebration. I mean, the shepherds were dazed. The angels were delighted. And Christmas was here, a time to rejoice. What an amazing birth. Whenever a royal is born, it's a big event, isn't it? It's a big event. In fact, when a royal is born in England, Buckingham Palace selects a special paper and puts the Buckingham uh, letterhead on that paper. And then they uh, inscribe the details of the birth and it is placed on a gilded easel at the front gates of Buckingham Palace. It's a big deal. A big deal. And yet when Jesus was born, a heavenly host appeared and the Shekinah glory of the Lord enveloped them. Wow. I'm telling you what, friends, it doesn't matter how much pomp and circumstance we connect to the births of the royals on earth. There is nothing to be compared to the birth of Jesus. When the glory of the Lord appeared and gave witness to this son who was being born. Christmas is a celebration. It was the birthday of a king, and birthdays are to be celebrated. But what makes this birthday extra special is it declared the love of God. That's what Christmas is all about. God demonstrating his love to us by sending his son into the world. The angel said, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. That's good news. It's a reason to celebrate. But that's not the reaction of the shepherds. I mean, at least not initially. They don't hear this message and then just jump up and down and start high-fiving each other, do they? The Bible says that they reacted with fear. That great fear came upon them. The King James says they were sore afraid. That sounds pretty bad. I mean, we don't talk like that nowadays, but that sounds pretty bad when you are sore afraid. In other words, they were terrified. They were paralyzed with fear. So why were they so afraid? Well, quite simply, the Shekinah glory cloud of the Lord appeared. The Bible describes this as a luminous cloud of God's presence. It appeared throughout Israel's history. When Israel was in the wilderness, the Shekinah glory cloud of the Lord was there. And it led them as a cloud, of, uh, as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. When they came to the Red Sea, it was the Shekinah glory cloud of the Lord that separated Israel from the Egyptians who were pursuing them. When they came to Mount Sinai, where the Lord was going to give the law to Moses, the glory cloud of the Lord engulfed the summit of that great mountain. And then, of course, at the dedication of the temple, the Bible says that the glory cloud of the Lord filled the temple to capacity to where the priests could not even minister because of it. And whenever the presence of God was manifested, there was great fear. That fear fell upon the people. When Isaiah had his vision of the Lord, he declared a curse on himself. And quite frankly, he expected for judgment to fall immediately. When Ezekiel saw the glory of God in a vision, he fell on his face and went into what we would describe as a canatonic stupor. When the Apostle John had a revelation and had a vision of Jesus, he fell on his face before him and he says, I became as a dead man. At Mount Sinai, when the glory cloud of the Lord engulfed the summit of that mountain and there were flashes of lightning and thunders and there was a voice that came forth from the cloud, they said, Moses, tell God not to speak to us anymore or we will die. You speak to us instead. At Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus, the glory of the Lord shone as a great light and a voice came, a thundering voice. And Saul was knocked to the ground and the men that were with him were paralyzed with fear. 
Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. And he is in the boat with the disciples on the Sea of Galilee and the waters are churning and they're about to be capsized. And they awaken Jesus and he stands and he says, Peace, be still. And the wind calms down and the waves lay flat and all becomes peaceful and serene. And great fear settles upon the disciples. And they, they say, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? It was the glory of the Lord being revealed. One day Jesus is walking along and he's ministering. And he's, he's in this pack of people, this great press, this great mass of people. And in the midst of that, a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years, she says, if I can just get to him and touch the hem of his garment, then I can be healed. And so she stretches forth her hand and she touches the hem of his garment. And immediately the Bible says, virtue flows into her body and she is healed instantaneously. And in the very next instant, great fear falls upon her, for she realizes she has just touched God. And now she has been made whole. Nowadays, there are some TV preachers who think that they can wield the glory of God like some magical power. That they can wield the glory of God like Luke Skywalker wielding his light saber. And so they will wave their hand over the crowd and the crowd will fall. Or they will breathe on the crowd and the crowd will fall. You know, maybe you need a breath mint if you breathe on a crowd and they fall. <laughs> Don't be fooled. That is not the glory of God. What is it? Psychologists would probably call it group think or group expectation. Maybe you would recognize it as mass hysteria. But it is not the glory of the Lord. For when the glory of the Lord appears, we would want to fall on our faces in reverential awe before Him. Because friends, if, if your God's glory can just be wielded by the hand of a televangelist, your God is too small. That is not the glory of the Lord. Manifestation of a holy and awesome presence of God results in reverential fear. The angel appeared to Mary. First words out of his mouth, do not be afraid. Angel appears to Zechariah. First words out of his mouth, do not be afraid. Angel appeared to the woman or, or to the women at the tomb after the resurrection. First words, do not be afraid. Jesus appears to the apostle John in the Revelation. First words, do not be afraid. The angel appeared to Daniel after three weeks of praying. First words out of his mouth, do not be afraid. Why? Because when it's real, <laughs> you can't help but shake in your boots. That the glory of the Lord appears. The one who spoke the word and planets were hurled into their orbits. Let's get our minds wrapped around this concept. We serve a big God. And when God moves, all we can do is stand there in awe. The Lord have mercy on me, a sinner. So the angel appeared and the glory of the Lord shone round the shepherds and they were greatly afraid. And the angel begins by reassuring them, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. There's a beautiful truth captured in that reality. That whenever that phrase was used of a messenger of the Lord, do not be afraid, what it meant was that God's grace was about to be revealed. Hallelujah. That whenever a messenger from God came and the first words the messenger said was, do not be afraid, the next message would be, God's grace was about to be manifested. Praise the Lord. And that's exactly what happens here. The angel gives this message of grace. It's a two-part message. The first part of that message, a Savior has been born. Say it with me. A Savior has been born. That the ancient prophecies have been fulfilled. A ruler has arisen in Bethlehem out of the house of bread. The bread of life has come. 
In the city of David now, the son of David has been born. And he is Savior. Back in the Old Testament, Moses was used of God to deliver the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage. And as long as they were wandering in the Sinai Peninsula, the wilderness, for 40 years, God cared for them. The Bible says that they grew hungry and they began to long for the flesh pots of Egypt. You know, can you just see that? You're hungry and you're thinking about the roast that's in the slow cooker, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm playing with fire now. <laughs> and they longed for the flesh pots of Egypt, but God provided for them. And God sent them bread from heaven, that it literally rained bread. And the Bible tells us that the bread that came down was small and round in substance, that it was fine like frost, that it was, it was white, probably looked like coriander seed. That when they would take that uh, bread that was rained from heaven, and they uh, would taste it. It tasted like wafers that were made from honey. But what was so, um, uh, you know, peculiar about it, it didn't look like what they expected it to look like. It didn't look like bread as they knew bread. And so it wasn't what they were expecting. And so what do they call it? Manna. Which translated means, what is it? What is it? Right? Manna. What is it? Bread from heaven. Likewise, Jesus is the bread from heaven and most do not recognize him for who he is. That he was sent to his own, but his own did not receive him. And yet as many as received him, he gave the power to become the sons and daughters of God. And yet they don't recognize him. Don't know him for who he is. Most people don't recognize Jesus. The Jews were expecting this powerful king who would immediately come and overthrow Roman oppression. That he would set up his throne in Jerusalem. He is the son of David and that he would restore the kingdom of Israel. Today, many see Jesus as a good teacher. They see Jesus as a good example, perfect man. One who was sent to show us how to live. One who was sent perhaps to establish a new religion. Yes, Jesus is the perfect man. He is the sinless one. He shows us how to live. He is the prophet of God. But, but the reason that he came was to save. The angel speaking to Joseph said, And you will call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Jesus. Jesus. That's a Greek translation of Yahshua. Yah, God. Shua saves. His very name means God saves. So yes, Jesus is a great teacher. Yes, he is a prophet. Yes, he's a perfect sinless man. But God sent Jesus to save his people from their sin. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Later on in his ministry, Jesus would say, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. I remember many years ago when Natalie was just a little, little bitty, probably third grade uh, elementary student, and she was having some medical issues. Uh, some of you know Natalie's epileptic. And so she was on this heavy anti-seizure medication. And they hadn't gotten everything figured out yet. So they were, you know, as doctors will do, they'll just try on a number of different things to see what works. Well, they had put her on this one drug that was so powerful that it left her in a stupor. And we didn't recognize that because it was still kind of building up in her system. Well, one day we came to school to pick Natalie up, and she wasn't there. Hmm. Well, let me park the car, and we'll go and we see, see if we can find her. So we parked, then we went in, and we turned that school upside down and could not find my little girl. And by this time, Anne is in a full-blown panic, and I'm out, of, I'm out of my mind. So I leave the school building, and we begin to search all through that area. And finally, Natalie is found in a neighborhood that she's never been to before and has no connection to the school, no connection to our home, wandering around, not knowing where she is or what she's doing. 
I remembered that story as I was preparing the message today, and it cast a whole new light on that saying, for the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. Because as a father, I know the passion with which I was chasing after my daughter. And it pales in comparison with the passion that our Lord has as he left the glories of heaven to seek and to save what was lost. He loves us, my friend, with a love that is beyond our comprehension. Loves us. It is a Savior who seeks. Seeking for me. Seeking for me. Though I knew him not, yet he loved me and was seeking for me. Some of you in this place this morning have not made Jesus the Lord of your life, and if that is you, I want to tell you, He is seeking for you. And the word from the Lord would be, today is the day of salvation. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. What better time to give your life to the Lord than during this season of Advent, wherein we celebrate His first coming, even as we await his return. The bad news is that men are lost, but the good news is that Jesus seeks and saves the lost. The bad news is that men are sinners, but the good news is that God sent a Savior. The bad news is the wages of sin is death, but the good news is that God's gift is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. God sent a Savior. It's the good news of the gospel. Can you say amen? And then the angel gives this second part of the message, the titles of Savior. He is Christ the Lord. Read that with me. He is Christ the Lord. One of my favorite Christmas carols is, What Child Is This? It's a beautiful song with a haunting melody. What child is this who's laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? What child is this? Friends, the way that you answer that question makes all the difference in the world. What child is this? We talked a little bit earlier about how some people have answered that question. Well, he was a good teacher. Well, he was the, the perfect one, the sinless one. He was a, a prophet of God. But those answers fall short of what the angel had to say about this child born on Christmas Day. What child is this? The angel answers that he is Christ the Lord. Christos, Kyrios, Messiah, and Lord. He is the anointed Lord. The anointed Lord. So let's break it down a little bit, take a closer look. Christos, Christ. What does it mean? It means he's the Messiah. He is the anointed one. And back in these days, in the Old Testament times, those who were called and appointed to high office were anointed. So if you were uh, uh, called to be a king, for example, then they would take a flask of oil, or more correctly, a horn of oil, and then they would pour it over the crown of your head and you were anointed, and it was a representation of being set apart by God, being clothed in this mantle that He had called you and now was empowering you by His Spirit to do the work to which you'd been called. And so when God called Saul to be the first king of Israel, Samuel the prophet was delegated to go and anoint him. And later on, when Saul turned his back, God and began to lead the country astray, God raised up a little shepherd boy named David. And Samuel was appointed to go and to anoint David as king of Israel. Throughout Matthew, Jesus is referred to as the king. He, he, one of the things that really earmarks Matthew's gospel is the kingship of Jesus. Of course, we recognize him as being the king of kings. So kings were anointed, but priests were also anointed. High priests were especially anointed. And the, the writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is our 
high priest. He is the mediator between God and man. That when He sacrificed His life on the cross of Calvary, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies and the Shekinah glory of God from the masses was torn asunder from top to bottom. And we are told in the Scriptures that that veil was nothing less than the body of Jesus that had been torn and pierced for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. That the chastisement of our peace was upon Him and by His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and each one has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. That Jesus died for our sins, was buried and raised again. He has ascended to the right hand of God the Father where He makes intercession for us today. And so His high office of the great high priest continues to function even now as Jesus is not only king, but He is priest. Anointed to be king. Anointed to be the high priest. And prophets were also anointed. In times past, God spoke to us through the prophets. But now He has spoken to us through His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom He made the world, the writer of Hebrews tells us. God's greatest prophet is Jesus. For when He speaks, it is the Word of God speaking. The Word of God. So Jesus is... The Anointed One. Christos, Christ, the Anointed One. Anointed to be prophet, priest, and king. And then the angel says he is Christ, the Lord. The Lord. Now sometimes this title is simply a title of respect. We know in England, for example, there are lords and ladies, right? That it's a title of respect, a title of deference. But in the New Testament, whenever you see this word Lord with a capital L, it is speaking of divinity. It is speaking of God. In fact, when the, the Old Testament Hebrew was translated into Greek, the word that is given for God, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, the Tetragrammaton, was translated Kyrios into Greek, kurios. It was translated that way 6,156 times, and every time that it was translated kurios, you know what it meant? God. And so everything that was attributable to Yahweh, God, was called Lord. And so when it's telling us, when the angel is saying, He is Christ the Lord, he is saying, this anointed one, this Messiah, this Christ is none other than God made flesh. Which is exactly why the prophet Isaiah said, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. He is the mighty God. So the good news is that a Savior has been born. He is the anointed one, the prophet, the priest, the king, and He is none other than God Himself, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. So what is the result? The result is great joy. The war is over. The war between sinners and God. That God has sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sin. And what that means? The one who would turn aside God's wrath. Who would, who would satisfy the justice of God. And make possible for His grace to be given. It is great joy for it's joy that is given to, to all that would come unto Him. He was made like us so that we could be made like Him. A host of the angels appear and begin to sing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace on whom His favor rests. It's a message of salvation 
given to all the people. Now we know that that all the people primarily referred, first of all, to Israel. Because this was how the shepherds would recognize that. It was a saying that they were familiar with. All the people. Oh, he's talking about us. He's talking about God's chosen, the elect. He's talking about Israel. But don't make the mistake in thinking that salvation is only for the Jew. Paul tells us that, it, that salvation is given to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And we even see that played out in the first few days of Jesus' life when Jesus is brought to the temple for dedication. And Simeon, taking him in his hands, raises him up and gives thanks to the Lord and he says that this one is a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. He is Israel's consolation and the Savior of mankind. The Savior of mankind. There is no other way to God but Jesus Christ. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus, the sinless one who gave his life. The little kids had it right. You can't have Christmas without a cross. That the story doesn't stop at Bethlehem. The story continued through a sinless life of ministry. Its summit was at an empty tomb that followed a bloody cross. He gave his life that we might live. I'm here to tell you this morning, Jesus brings joy. But there was great joy at the angelic announcement. There was great joy at the birth of Jesus. There was great joy at his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. There was great joy at the empty tomb that he left. And for his people... There will be great joy at His glorious appearing. Can you say amen? amen? All of that to say this, to ask this question. Do you know the joy of Jesus? Because if you don't know the joy of Jesus, what better time than today? What better season than the season of Advent when we celebrate the first coming of the Lord. What better time than now to give your life to Jesus Christ, to invite Him to come and be your Savior and Lord, recognizing that you, like all of us, are a sinner in need of a Savior. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Won't you make Him your Lord today? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beauty of Christmas and for the glory of this message that Jesus is born in Bethlehem, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I pray today, God, for those of us who already know you, that that message will become more important and more dear to us than ever before. That as we celebrate this Christmas tide, it will be a celebration that reflects on the true meaning of Christmas when God gave His Son. I pray, Lord, for those that don't know You, for those under the sound of my voice and perhaps even watching or listening on the Internet, that, God, You will move in their hearts and that You will draw them by Your Spirit, that You will choose them. And, Father, I pray that as You do, they will find faith in their hearts to declare Jesus is Lord. Today, Lord, we pray that as we are celebrating this season, that not only will it be a season of reflection for us, but we also pray that it will be a season of mission, that you will help us to look for the opportunities that we are given to share this great joy that we have with those who have not yet received it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.